Welcome back to World War II TV, folks, and uh, we are continuing Railways Week. The show with Peter Steer that was meant to be last night looks like it'll be next Thursday now. Still got problems with his microphone. But anyway, joining me today from near Rome in Italy is World War II TV viewer turned guest Nicola Sagini. We are going to look at the, uh, the significance of the Brenner Pass and the Allied attempts to hit nor northern Italy's railway network. If you're new to the channel, welcome aboard. Don't forget, everything you need is in the description below, and maybe consider becoming a patron or a channel member. But without further ado, I'll bring Nicola in. Good evening, sir. How are you today? Good evening. I'm very well, excited as well. <laughs> and hello, everybody. It's, it's uh, just an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Brilliant. So living in Italy, I mean, the Brenner Pass, it's kind of part, part of a, it's the, the, the important geographical connection from Italy to the, the northern part of Europe. But where was your inspiration for coming on? I know I kind of, you saw my plea for guests about railways and we taught, chatted on Twitter, but when when did your um, inspiration or interest in this battle battle campaign area begin? So basically, it happened all by chance. Um I, I hit upon one of my uh, mutual friends on Twitter. And uh, he posted uh, that he just got this book. And um, all of a sudden, I was oh, small uh, booklets. Um, and I was like, oh, um, this is good material to start researching the topic. And so when I just, uh, picked it up. And started reading it, and it just, uh, as usually happens to me, it completely opened up a new subject for um, for my uh, interest. And as you usually do, I went all the way to the back, and I look at other possible books and uh, readings I could do on this. And then I started researching more and more, basically. Brilliant. Well, we had a couple of internet blips there. I hope... Oh, 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 oh. This is Nick. Great, folks. But we, we last uh, yesterday's show didn't happen at all. And now we've been chatting away, Nick and me, in a test. And now I seem to have lost him. Well, well, um, don't we just love technology when these things go like this? Um, but we will bring Nicola back as soon as we can. In the meantime, thanks to all the new patrons who joined joined us. Um, yep, he's dropped out. Hopefully, we'll come back in again in a minute. Um, I hate it when these things happen. Um, but while we're here, good time to talk about um again the the fact that so many of you have been uh signing up for Patreon. Uh, the funding of the channel is very important. I want to make this my major thing as we move forward into 2024. You may have noticed uh, new shows on YouTube, the ones for the middle and latter part of November. They're all up there right now. Um, just hope that Nicola comes back in okay and we can carry on with this show. I don't know what's going on. Um, they're back in again. I don't know what was happening yeah, there. I don't, know end like, end, I don't know. But. I don't know. I just changed connection. So at least uh, uh, maybe <laughs> if it was me, I, I should have solved it. So anyhow, I don't know where you lost me, but uh, we were just talking about uh, your book. Also go through it again. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, I started with this book where I found on Twitter from one of the people I follow, and he follows me back. And just by reading it, it widened my interest. And so I went all the way to the back and I started looking at for other books that, uh, because frankly, this one, I, I really didn't like it all that much, but uh, the topic seemed very interesting. So I wanted to know more. Um, and then I explored other books and then found other material online, which I also uh, share with you that you may post um, to... Um, to, to uh, your your channel and uh, for others also to to be able to download them because some of the material is in PDF uh, because it's actually all the way back it's all the way back to 1945 but uh, some generous folks uh, scan them and put them uh, online yeah all the links are in the description below yeah. so uh, because you dropped out you've got to upload your, your PowerPoint again but we'll do that so yeah there's yes. if you notice in the description chaps there's and chap Hess is watching there are various links that Nicola has provided so you can learn more about this beyond the show but um we are back up and running um so folks um I'll hang I'm gonna hand over to Nicola now feel free to fire away with your questions as we go along and we're all gonna sit back and learn about the Brenner Pass so over to you Okay, thanks. Uh, so just a few words about myself. Uh, um, I am by no means a professional historian. I would just describe myself as uh, somebody uh, greatly interested in history and in particular in military history. 
And uh, I would say that uh, I have a I come from a different angle in engaging with the topics in general, uh, which is I make uh, or contribute to make uh, games um, about uh, uh, war games in particular, about uh, certain battles or certain uh, engagements. And uh, you can see in this slide uh, some of the things I have uh, collaborated on. We are talking about mainly cardboard uh, war games, so not miniature. Uh, I have nothing against the miniature, but I have just not done anything uh, with them. Um, and you can see some of the work I have uh, contributed to, uh, all the way up to uh, the far right, uh, where uh, you can see some of the games I actually designed from the ground up. And... Uh, um, and the one on the right, uh, right hand side, far right hand side, are all my uh, basically all my work except for the art. Um, and uh, there are more to come, including one about uh, the Battle of the Brenner. So, in a way, the subject also became a war game. Um, Brilliant. <laughs> I don't know when it will be published. Uh, I have a publisher which is interested. Uh, the work on it is uh, at a fairly good. Uh, point i still have to write the rules but uh, most of the mechanics are down and then play testing and then hopefully it will become a game as well brilliant well so we know when you publish and we, we will put the link up on on this on this show so people well, can go and find it thank and you I, I like people who are war gamers because it means you've not just looked at what happened you've had to look at alternative scenarios as well because you have to look at them the way the game could pan out and it means you you, you come at these battles from a slightly um non-conventional point of view yeah, it's it's for me. It's a way to engage with history. First of all, because you have to do uh, a lot of research to get the basics down, um, and to understand uh, the model that you want to build. Because ultimately, all the games are models of the reality, and which actors and factors you want to represent. I'm paraphrasing a great uh, game designer here using his work. But, uh, uh, in order to do that, you know, to you need to know the history. But the good thing or the interesting thing about wargaming is that they also pose a challenge because you have to make the model work with one or two players or more players involved and with each possibility, a range of possibilities to develop. So you, it's not fully scripted because otherwise it would be a book. Um, right. and, and, and this, you know, in a way makes you engage with history in a, in a slightly different way. Another thing you need to learn is uh, geography, uh, which was a big, uh, uh, a big plus for me. Uh, <laughs> um, because I was ignorant about many settings and, uh, and many, uh, and, and, and many, uh, geographical features that a specific battle may have. So I suggest, uh, maybe we press on, uh, yep. with the topic. Okay. So the topic for tonight is the battle of the Brenner. And, uh, this is, uh, um, the attempt uh, by the Allies to severe the lifeline of the German forces in Italy in the winter of 1944 to 1945. Um, this is uh, pretty much the structure of the presentation. Uh, we will go through uh, the strategic situation. We will talk a little bit about the railroad, the railroad network uh, um, of Italy, Northern Italy in World War II. Uh, the Brenner line in particular, and then we will go and delve into the battle. So, um, and then I will also mention the sources, uh, but as uh, Paul just said, you will find them uh, also attached to, uh, to this video. So here's the situation in November 1944. Um, you can see that uh, the Allies had managed uh, to push basically all the way up to the Gothic line in the summer of 1944. Um, and also, they attempted a breakthrough um, at the end of the summer of 1944, but um, due to several factors, uh, they only managed to slightly pierce the Gothic line, um, especially in the east, on the east coast. Uh, but eventually, they were stopped by two main things. The onset of the wet and the mud and cold season, and uh, the fact that the Gothic line runs basically in the Apennines, so uh, which is um, uh, part uh, of the uh, mountain range uh, that goes all the way down the spine of Italy. Um, and in this particular um, uh, part of Italy, the Apennines almost go from west to east. 
So there is really little plain left on each side. It's mostly mountains. So these two, um, these two items, uh, the, uh, these two factors contributed to stopping the Allies short of piercing the Gothic line. Because the main idea was if we break through the Gothic line, we make it into the plain, the Po River Plain, which is the big area I have highlighted here in gray. Uh, then basically we will be on the loose and uh, we will defeat the Germans. So they tried everything they could, but eventually they were stopped short. And logistics here was a nightmare. You have to consider that some of the accounts say that uh, at the end of October, the last 10 miles to supply troops at the front line, they could only be made by, for the first five miles, uh, small jeeps or other small off-road vehicles. And then the last five miles, only by mule packs and by people hand carrying uh, the supplies. So, of course, this was... Uh, absolutely impossible to concentrate supplies for a major offensive uh, at that point. So realizing this, what the Allied did was, okay, we will stop uh, any offensive operation on the ground, but we will concentrate and use air power to starve the Germans out in, pre in preparation for the spring offensive, which actually then uh, took place. Um, as you can see here, so we have uh, the United States 5th Army on the West Coast, uh, the uh, British 8th Army on the uh, East Coast, uh, and then facing them, there is Army Group C. Um, in terms of divisions, uh, the Germans uh, plus the Italian fascist regime after uh, 1943, after September 1943, accounted for more divisions than the Allies. But if you look at the number of troops, uh, we are seeing we are seeing that they are basically equal. Of course, the Army Group C enjoyed the advantage of being on a defensive, prepared defensive positions on the Gothic line. So uh, this is the strategic situation, and this is what prompted the Allies to go for an, off an air offensive aimed at uh, uh, starving the Germans out. Now, uh, this is the rail war, uh, railroad network of uh, northern Italy uh, in World War II. This is an actual map uh, which, is, which comes from U.S. documents. Um, this map was drawn in 1945, so basically it's, it's a fair representation of the status uh, of the railway lines. Uh, <clears throat> I have highlighted uh, in, in blue the main hubs. You have Milan on the far west side. Uh, then next uh, in line uh, is uh, basically Verona. So if you just move on a horizontal line to the east, this is going to be one of the major hubs we are going to look at during the whole presentation because it's actually the departure or end point uh, of the Brenner line. And then if you go all the way up north, uh, you see another major hub, which is Innsbruck in Austria. Okay. So this line is actually the Brenner line. Then we will look at it in more details. Then moving farther west, uh, sorry, east, you hit uh, other um, important uh, hubs, which are Vicenza and, and Padua. And then, of course, there is Venice. And then all the way up, uh, uh, going uh, northeast, you have Udine. And then you have Klagenfurt uh, and you have Ljubljana in, in, in uh, the former Yugoslavia. Now, um, this is to say what? This is to say that, as you can tell by this picture, the west end of Italy is not of interest. Why is that? Because this is uh, the fall of 1944, and uh, the Allies had already uh, undertook uh, Operation Dragoon. So they had already invaded the southern front, the, the south of France, and by then they had already sealed off. Western uh, border, so there is no need to go to the west. The other point is that uh, the first uh, pass that you see is Brenner Pass, number one. There is nothing west of it because to the west of it, there is Switzerland. In Switzerland, formally neutral, uh, Germany could have railways going through, first of all, because Switzerland itself was dependent from uh, Germany for major. Um, uh, supplies of raw materials, in particular coal. Um, and second, the, the agreement was, okay, you buy as we call, we let uh, you use our railways and you can go with, your, with our railways to Italy, but only if you use this for supply. You cannot move troops through our, uh, through our territory and um, you cannot move uh, uh, war material, so tanks uh, or, or, or other items. 
Um, and therefore, from our analysis point of view, this is not an interesting part uh, because Switzerland was mainly just used to route the supplies um, through uh, and to get supplies from Germany, but it was not um, supplying uh, weapons, for example, to the frontline troops uh, in of all groups. Uh, this leaves only five options to go out of Italy or to go into Italy from Germany. Number one, we all uh, and this is to be the focus of our just, just uh, for a second, um, Nicola, sure. Your 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 signal is 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 bouncing a little bit. Um, are you Wi-Fi or heart or cable? No, I'm Wi-Fi. I got the cable actually. Is your so. phone connected to the Wi-Fi signal as well? No, I have uh, I have uh, I have removed it. Okay. Oh well, I, I don't know. Is it better now, it's, it's or just... or is it better? It's a little or not? bit better. A little bit better now. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll carry on. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Just, it, it so was as I said, a bit. no, no, it's okay. It's okay. So um, as I said, you only have five access points. Number one is the Brenner. Number two is the Tarvisio Pass. Uh, number three is the Piedicolle route. Uh, another pass, and number four is the Postumia route. Then there is a fifth route, which is called the Dolomite, and it's actually not represented here on the map, except for if you look uh, hardly, you can see that uh, there is like a dotted red line here. This is the Dolomite route, but it was a single gauge or single track, narrow gauge, so the normal rolling stock used everywhere else could not fit on this railway. You will have to stop. Uh, it's, 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 it's cutting in and out again now, Nicola. Um, could, could, do you want to try dropping in and out again? Come back in. I know it's a pain, but uh, sometimes that works it. Yeah. Your jam is stuck completely now. Sorry, folks. Technical problems abound this week. Um, I have to. Um, is it better? Uh, uh, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So hopefully this will last. Um, otherwise, I I have finished my tricks. So, anyhow, uh, as I said, uh, the fifth line is not represented here because it was of small importance. So because it's actually this dotted the red line here. It was a single track, narrow gauge. Narrow gauge means that you cannot use the standard uh, rolling stock that you use everywhere else. You have physically to unload the train and load everything onto another train, which has a shorter span of the tracks, okay? And so this was basically just a tourist route, and it was never actually used uh, uh, during, uh, during the war, except for some hospital trains, okay? So um, just a word about uh, these three uh, other routes, why they're not part of the Battle of the Brenner or why they were not used to starve out the German uh, the German uh, uh, Army Group C. The actual point is that they were used, they were bombed as well to um, starve the Germans out. But you have to take into account that uh, um, these lines are made with uh, uh, some very specific targets on them that once you get rid of them, especially bridges, each Large, very long and very tall bridge that uh, when you get rid of it is basically almost impossible to repair. So this is exactly what the Allies did. They concentrated on these targets that they had identified and once you, they bombed them, basically the Germans were left with very few options to use these lines. Okay? Yep. So this is why also they had to concentrate on the Brenner. Then we will also uh, talk more about uh, why they had to concentrate on the Brenner because the Brenner, and we will see in a little while why. Um, there is also uh, perhaps one last thing I would like to say. Uh, we haven't talked about this. Uh, um, what was the minimum requirement? Uh, because you can see here uh, the, the, the totals that can be moved on each line. Imagine that for Army Group C to sit in defensive position on the Gothic line, all they needed was about six. As you can see, 
with all these lines fully operational, they could accrue a lot more. Okay, so the allies had to reduce these amounts, these amounts, to just barely six thousand uh, tons in order. Uh, aid to. It's it's jumping again, Nicola. Uh, can can we try switching your camera off and just? I know we won't be able to see you, but just keep the slides up and switch your camera off. That might give you the juice uh, you need. You're not going to do anything if you. I mean, it's. But it should still still the power. Uh, Right. Can I can, can say, say something? Hello, Are hello. You? Yep, I've got hello? you. Yep. Okay. This is sounding better so far. Let's let's carry on. Sorry about this, folks. These things happen. Hey, I'm sorry about that. Um... Everything was working before we started. <laughs> we can test that's, that's always the way. We were sitting talking for 10 minutes, everything was fine. As soon as we start, it goes weird. But no, we're, we're, we're back, and then we'll bring your video back in later on. But as long as the audio is okay. Okay. So, but don't worry about the video. As I said, I'm not pretty to look at. So, no worries. Um, that said, the Brenner line. So, the Brenner line is here in all its uh, glory. As you can see, it goes from Verona in northeast uh, Italy, the town which is famous for Romeo and Juliet. Um, all the way up to Innsbruck in Austria. And the characteristics of the Brenner Pass are very peculiar. This is the only railway line that uh, does not go through a pass through a tunnel. A tunnel. It, the, the, the actual pass is out of any tunnel, and it's quite low. It's about 4,000 feet. Okay, So um, th this makes it ideal um, for development. And indeed, uh, this is uh, all the way from Innsbruck to Verona, a dual truck, a standard gauge, fully electrified line. So this was the mo most modern line that you can think of, uh, even at the times of uh, World War II. Uh, another important characteristic uh, characteristics is that, uh, for example, to give you an idea of uh, the express uh, speed that you can go through this line, you could go from Verona to Vienna in 12 hours. Uh, you could go from Verona to Berlin in 24 hours. So this is uh, uh, really the most direct route uh, into Germany. Um, now, as you can see here, um, conceptually, we can divide uh, this line into four main areas. The first goes from uh, Verona, all the way up to a town which is called Ala. And here, the main characteristics are there are no main bridges. Um, there is lots of fields or embankment. Then we will talk more about what fields are. Uh, but basically, imagine, uh, imagine uh, uh, long stretches of railway which run very close to rivers and have lots of earth packed below them okay um and uh the other characteristics is that uh, uh peaks around uh, mountain peaks around uh, this area are uh quite uh, uh quite small about 4000 4500 feet okay um there are there is also one specific characteristics uh, um which we will talk about about more later which is at Santa Brojo this is the only part of the line that allows to attempt for a bombing force to uh, cause a landslide. So bombing the, the mountain flank to have uh, all the rocks and all the material drop on, on the railway lines beneath. This is the only place where you can attempt that on the Brenner line. Then there is the second part. The second part goes, goes from Ala to Trento. Uh, Trento is the next big town after Verona. And uh, um, in this case, uh, the valley is uh, somewhat wider. Um, and uh, uh, but and there are also eight uh, small bridges. 
along this line, uh, this part of the line. Uh, they are all uh, less than 130 feet in length. Uh, and finally, at Trento, you can see it here, there is a loop line that goes all the way to the east and connects to the railways that go to the northeast. Um, this line uh, was also bombed, of course, uh, to take it out of action. Uh, but uh, it's singular that there is this uh, branching of the line at Trento. Um, then the following part is from Trento to Bolzano. Bolzano is an, the other uh, next uh, big town. Uh, here we have fewer bridges, but they tend to be uh, much longer. And especially the one you see here at La Vis, this is the longest one in the Brenner line. And it, in fact, it was subject of uh, major uh, attention by uh, the attackers. Um, the other point is that uh, here the valley is even wider and uh, uh, there, there are more opportunities for diversions. Actually, you can see them marked uh, here on the map. So basically, diversions means railway tracks which are constructed to go around the main line and connect uh, two uh, or more stations along the way, just bypassing the main railway line. And we will see that this has a major important. This was uh, something very important for the Germans to keep the line operational. Um, the final part is from Bolzano to Innsbruck. This is uh, where the mountains become extremely high. We're talking about peaks of uh, 12,000 to 15,000 feet, uh, where the valley is now much steeper uh and this means also that there was no, no possible diversion um there are numerous bridges and finally there is one small loop line you can see it here that goes all the way to austria but again this one was a single track and it was easy to put it out of action uh one word about what goes on this line we talked about supplying army group c uh but this is not the only use that railway lines in Italy uh, had. There was a major looting by the Germans of Italian heavy machinery from all the north, north part of Italy. North part of Italy historically has always been the most uh, industrial. And uh, they, after we signed the armistice with the allies uh, or we turned coats, depending on how you want to look at it, <laughs> uh, the Germans basically went after all the heavy machinery that they could find and they dismantled it and they shipped it to uh, Germany. Uh, so this, this was a major uh, line for this type of operation. Uh, the other thing is that you have to take into account that in Verona itself, uh, the Germans established uh, uh, over 30 ammunition factories, um, as well as uh, motor transport uh, depots and as well as logistical depots. But the, the ammunition factory is important because Italy itself did not have all the raw materials to produce uh, ammo. And so this material had to come from Germany to supply and, and keep these, uh, these uh, industries in, in operation. Um, so this is why I, I just recapped here that it's not only supplying Army Group C, but it's really a lot of traffic going uh, both ways. One last uh, important uh, uh, bit is, and we will see that this had a relevance, is the use of this line to rapidly redeploy forces stationed in Italy to other fronts uh, that Germany was facing at the time. We are right. talking about the winter of 1944 and uh, the beginning of 1945, major Soviet offensive. Uh, the Allies pushing from the West. The Germans at one point needed to reroute forces uh, from the Italian theater to these new theaters. And as you will see, the bombing campaign carried out by the Allies really hindered this effort. So it's also in, in this more strategic context that we have to look at uh, this railway line. Here, I just superposed... Uh, what the orography of the terrain looks like when you look at this map, uh, considering also, also the uh, mountains. So mm. you can really appreciate that this line is fully nestled from the beginning to the end in the mountains. We will see some pictures also uh, and for what this means uh, for the bombing activities. But before we get to the bombing... Okay, so thanks. 
So before we get to the bombing activities, we have to look at who the bombers were. Um, so the main effort against the Brenner line in this period was uh, um, was made by the 57th uh, uh, Bomb Wing, which was part of the 12th uh, Air Force, um, which in turn constitutes the bulk of uh, the Mediterranean Allied Tactical Air Force. Um, this uh, wing was composed of uh, four groups, um, but uh, during the battle, one group was actually recalled to the States uh, because they needed to transition to another uh, aircraft model in preparation for being redeployed to the Pacific. And that was the third, 319th uh, bomb group. Uh, <clears throat> one word uh, about uh, uh, this uh, uh, bomb wing. This bomb wing was led by General Knapp. Um, and uh, General Knapp is uh, quite a character. He held uh, one of the very first, uh, uh, one of the very first uh, uh, um, pilot licenses in the U.S. He actually met and flew with the Wright Flyers. So we're talking about somebody that actually knew aviation from the very beginning. And he was actually responsible for uh, most of the tactical use of the B-25s. And he was involved uh, from the very beginning in developing the training syllabus and uh, uh, also in selecting, uh, hand-picking the pilots, the initial pilots that uh, comprised uh, uh, the, the bomb force. So he's quite, uh, he's quite the character. And they were based in what uh, they, it was called at the time the USS Corsica. Uh, so mimicking the Navy. Um, Corsica is, uh, if we look back, is just an island uh, on the northern part uh, of uh, the Tyrrhenian Sea, um, formerly part of France, of course. So this is also where Napoleon was born, but uh, most of you would probably know this better than me. And uh, um, the 57th Bomb Wing uh, was stationed uh, at, the air uh, at the airfields of uh, Gizonaccia, of Solenzara, and of Alessand. And so each time they would have, I'm sorry, each time they would have to bomb the Brenner, they would fly the most direct route uh, to uh, the Brenner itself, uh, generally passing between Genova and La Spezia, and then arching north, east, and then all the way back. So we look at the targets. We spoke a little bit about them, but now we go into the details. Um, several types of targets uh, uh, presented themselves uh, um, for uh, this campaign. Uh, the first one, and probably the most important actually, uh, were the transformer stations. Now, there are 14 transformer stations uh, all across the 170 miles of the Brenner line. And what the Allied, uh, with the helps of the Italians that knew this railway line quite well, understood was that unless they managed to bomb three continuous transformer stations, they could not cut the electrical power on the railway. So actually the opening act of uh, the, Brenner, the Battle of the Brenner was a major raid on four transformer stations carried out by B-25s and P-47s. Um, to cut these four stations. And the Allies were so successful in doing this. They were located in the lower part of the Brenner, but they were so successful in doing this, they obliterated them so bad that they were never rebuilt. So from the November 6th, which was the day of this operation called Operation Bingo, the Allies knew that the Germans had to use steam locomotives for the last part, the last stretch of the Brenner. And this immediately produced a drop in the traffic. Because, of course, imagine you have a perfectly working railway line the day before. The next day, you have to call in steam locomotives from Germany and uh, uh, bring them um, into the line in order to uh, supplement or replace uh, the electrical locomotives. Um, then we spoke about bridges. Um, the Brenner line had only eight large bridges over 200 feet in length and you can see them listed here um, and of these only four could actually be attacked because the other four were either uh, difficult or almost impossible to attack because of the terrain we will talk about the terrain a little bit uh, more later um, or because of the flak concentration 
that the Germans managed uh, to uh, put into the uh, around these bridges, and we will talk about flat concentration uh, a little later. Uh, so what the Allies were actually left with was bombing the small bridges. You can see an example on the right. Um, these are between 40 to 100 feet in length, and you are bombing them from somewhere around 12,000 feet. So as you can imagine, this is no small feat of accuracy. Um, the other point is that most of the bridges on the Brenner line, also the large ones, but especially the small ones, are very low above the water. You can also see them in the pictures. Right, yeah. This means that repairing them was extremely easy for the Germans. And we would talk about the repair efforts because what the Battle of the Brenner really was, was a continuous struggle between the United States Army Air Force obliterating targets and the Germans repairing them. And eventually the mass that uh, the mass of bombs that the Allies could um, unleash on, on these targets was so much that the Germans failed to keep up. But this was only several months later, and we will talk about more the repair efforts. Other targets, marshalling yards. Marshalling yards, are they look like brilliant targets. Uh, you see lots of rolling stocks um, parked on the side. Uh, this is an actual picture of the marshalling yard in Trento. Okay, So you can see lots of tracks, lots of rolling stock, and you go like, oh, this is a perfect target. Guess what? This is the easiest thing you can repair. This is a post-bomb damage assessment uh, picture. And if you, if you really look closely, the leftmost line is already operational. So they wreck havoc on the marshalling yard. And a few hours later, it was already operational. You could already go through it. And yes, it could kill a lot of rolling stock, but the Germans had plenty. So this was um, initially was thought that it was going to be a good target. But the, uh, the, the eventual reality was that these were not so good. They, they became better when more cuts in the lines had been made. Then what, the, what happened was that there was a concentration of rolling stock uh, uh, because they could not go further. And then at that point, it was more uh, effective to bomb them. But until you produce cuts, these targets were not, were not that great. Right. Um, then in the center, what we have is landslide. We talked about it. Uh, on paper, they look like the perfect target. Why is that? Because instead of uh, repairing, you need heavy machinery to remove all the material that came from the mountain. And what the Allies did, they consulted with the, the Italian railway engineers and the Italian railway engineers told them that there was this specific target. This picture is actually from this real uh, target at Sant'Ambrogio. Uh, and told them there is a lot of hanging rocks and material ready to fall down. So if you bomb this area precisely, you are going to be able to cause a, land, a massive landslide on the railway. So the Allies went for it and several times. But the reality was they were never able... Even hitting the targets with precision, they were never able to cause the, the, the landslide. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the last type of target. We spoke briefly about them before, the rail fields. These were, so the rail field, in this case, you see the, and then on the right-hand side, the, and the tracks uh, in, in correspondence uh, of the, uh, the bend of the river, or the river bend, I'm sorry, uh, run over a lot of earth. So what the Allies thought was like, okay, if we bomb this, this is a large area, so it's easy to bomb accurately. Um, basically, we will cause the track and all the land to slide into the river. And this was true. So they were easy to bomb. But then what they, the Allies found out that was that the Germans were very, very good at repairing them very efficiently and very uh, quickly. So in the end, they kind of dropped this type of target because it was proving to be uh, too costly. So this is just a, a, a recap of what the targets were, how many there were on the line, and how many times they were bombed. 
um, and the sorties for each uh, uh, for each uh, uh, type of target. And finally, the total tonnage of bombs drop on those type of targets. So you can see that the bridges, of course, receive the most of the attention. Uh, you can also see that uh, uh, the, the landslides um, were attempted and uh, the, also bombing the mouth of tunnels, but they were not very effective. So really, the main concentration of bombing was on bridges and on uh, rail fields. Now, we talk about the defenses. So the defenses were mainly of uh, three types. The first type is flak, and this was the, mo the most active of the defenses. Uh, the pictures at the bottom give you an idea of the buildup of flak concentration over the targets um, from October 1944 to March 1945. And you can see that the number of heavy guns, we're talking about 88s, um, both uh, FLAC uh, 36 and FLAC uh, 41, that were actually deployed on the line. So you can see mm -hmm. that we go from um, a very heavy concentration around Verona on the left-hand picture, and some around Trento and some around Bolzano. And then progressively, basically the entire line is covered in FLAC, okay? Uh, these flags were initially hastily deployed on the valley floor, but then what they did was uh, the Germans uh, basically uh, raised these flags on the peaks nearing the valley, which basically, first of all, drastically reduced uh, the flying time of the projectiles and the effective height that they could reach. Um, and second, uh, it made for much better field of view. Um, these flags were uh, concentrated in what the Germans called Grossbatterien, which means uh, a concentration of heavy and light flak, all directed by uh, a single fire, uh, fire direction, uh, fire commander. Um, you can see a picture of an actual uh, uh, Grossbatterie uh, on the right-hand side. So you see six heavy uh, pits, uh, another six heavy pits, uh, then three light. Uh, this is a 37 millimeter flak. Um, and then uh, you can see the fire direction, the fire control apparatus, which was uh, both uh, the um, stereoscopy uh, optical uh, uh, tracking as well as the radar tracking. Not only that, but generally there were two fire control apparatus for each gross battery, which means that they could follow two different formations at the same time and they could manage a uh, handover between one formation and the other. Most of the fire in this particular case was of uh, the uh, pointed direction, which means that they were actually tracking the targets and they were trying to shoot them down. Barrage was very seldomly used in this case. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the eff now the, the efficacy of, of this type of fire, it looks like a lot of guns, um, and one would expect that the loss rate was uh, significant. In reality, you have to take into account that uh, overall, the uh, losses for the Allies were never higher than 1% uh, in terms of uh, really downing the, the, the aircraft. Wow, uh, it was that's very, that's very low, isn't it? I mean, it is because when you get into Germany in early '45, particularly, that's when the Luftwaffe is now concentrated around the city. The the, the losses are increasing. I mean, the, the losses to Flak, it's right. interesting. Arc the Eighth Air Force, for example, the Flak losses go up as the war goes on. Kind of fighter losses go down a bit, but um, this is really interesting. What well, quick question from Andreas watching? Sure, the, the increased flak they bring in, the increased defenses is that new weaponry coming from Germany or are they moving yes. it back from other? Yeah, new weaponry, new weaponry coming from mainly from Germany. Some of the some of the weaponry was uh, was actually brought in from other areas of Italy, especially in uh, Liguria, which means the uh, the western part. Uh, uh, but mainly it was coming from Germany because at one point the Germans were desperate to keep this line operational. Right. And so they concentrated the maximum effort of flak in, in this area. Um, the real point was that even though the loss rate was so low, 
generally these losses were catastrophic, meaning that uh, the um, the aircraft would be blown out of the sky, and this had a huge effect on the morale of the surviving air crews um, because uh, you really are flying with your buddies uh, in a I don't know nine ship formation, and all of a sudden one of them just gets blown out of the sky and this was so casual uh, also and they were you have to think about if you remember the previous slide they were attacking many many times the same targets yeah so what they were fearing was okay the germans know we are going to come back so they know where we come from also because we will look at uh, why in in a minute and so next time it's going to be me and this was this was really a problem um, mm. Something else we need to talk about uh, is that uh, uh, for the B-25 crews uh, to have a ticket home, so to complete their tour of duty, they had to do 60 missions in October. And then General Knapp raised this limit uh, to 65 in November. Then in December, this was brought up to 70. And in February... He told them, you can't go home until the war is over. And so these people were counting. Imagine you are a 58, and all of a sudden, the uh, quota was uh, raised to 65. Mm. And then it was raised to 70. And then it was for the duration of the war. So this really put a strain on the morale of the air crews. This combined with the fact that, okay, flak was so random that it, next time it could be you. One last catch. <laughs> Let me use this word, uh, <laughs> even though I see from the chat that most people got the reference. One last catch was that um, you could not count a mission flown unless you were dropping bombs. So if for some reason you take off and over the route or over the target, the weather does not allow you to drop bombs. And they actually recall you back to Corsica. That doesn't count as one of your 60, 65 of 70 uh, missions. Uh, so maybe you're covering this later on, Nicola. But because they're hitting these same targets again, 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 are they doing it the same altitude, same flight paths each time, or are they mixing it up to try and give the Germans we something have, yes. different to think about? Here, here's, here's the catch again. The terrain in this part of uh, the railway is uh, really difficult from yeah. a bombing point of view. As you can see, this is a, an actual picture, and the, the black arrow is pointing at the target. Can you see the target? That's yep. a bridge. And the target, you can see the arrow, but you, if the arrow wasn't there, yeah, I bet yeah, you yeah, couldn't yeah. see the target, okay? So this is the first point. Targets were always very difficult to spot. Uh, the second point uh, is that uh, you have sometimes uh, between the initial point and the bomb release, only less than four miles to actually get your bearings, identify the target, and then drop. So four miles flying at uh, 200 knots. That's just uh, just a few seconds, okay? So sometimes uh, you would have to go around and make another pass. Now, steep valleys also means that you have only one or two preferential avenues of approach. You cannot approach from 360. You need to be able to look the target uh, in the distance, uh, aim your bombs, uh, release your bombs. So this may also means for means that uh, for a lot of the targets, uh, the avenue of approaches were were always the same even mm. if you had to bomb them uh, uh, a few days later. So it was, again, really an effort between the air crews and the flak to try and find ways around this. Um, the terrain itself also, we are, we are talking about mountains, and uh, this um, means also that a lot of times, as you can see here, um, the, uh, the weather was not cooperating. So you could not fly missions. And this, as we will see, gave the opportunity to the repair crews to go after the target that you just bombed and repair it so that you would have to bomb it in one week while you were standing down because of the weather. Right. So, um, and in, in a way, the terrain itself was one of the defensive 
measures that uh, the Germans uh, uh, found, uh, of course, in, in many ways uh, prepared by nature, but they exploited it to the max. And an example is given to the right-hand side of the slide, which is uh, the fact that they started to understand that they could use smoke uh, generators. Okay? So as you can see here in the picture uh, at the bottom, but also the one on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, there, it seems like uh, this railway is fuming. There is smoke raising. This is actual smoke generated uh, by chlorosulfidic acid in big containers um, and uh, uh, just deployed all around uh, the most uh, uh, critical targets. And the weather and the wind conditions uh, in the valleys sometimes really helped because they kept the pressure was so high that they kept the smoke low to the ground. Um, and so for the, for the bomber crews, it was very, very difficult to identify the target at that point. And with a small uh, run between the IP and bomb, and bomb drops, it meant that they couldn't release, basically. Okay? Um, I saw in the chat briefly that people uh, talked about winds and turbulence. Yes, winds and turbulence were a factor. And in fact, uh, there are many reports, uh, mission reports, that talk about uh, almost... Uh, uh, colliding uh, between the bomb uh, collisions between the bombers and this was a factor that also scared the crews a lot um, one other point especially when going for targets uh, of the upper Brenner here peaks are around we saw before around 12,000 to 14,000 feet guess what the b25s did not have oxygen so this was a major factor also for the morale of the crew you had to fly a mission to bomb a target you just bombed the day before or two days before and you have to fly at 15,000 feet without oxygen. And there was no centralized heating. This is no B-17. This is B-25s. So the crews had to don uh, multiple layers of clothing to make sure that they would stay warm. And um, frostbite was always an issue on hands and feet. Uh, because as you can... is uh, the stick is is very difficult to do with multiple layers of gloves so uh, all of this contributed uh, to um to a morale to a drop in morale for for the crews even even though they were they were keep going and bombing also because they needed those tickets home um mm -hmm. it, it really it was another factor in the morale so some of you may guess uh, but where was the air force uh, the German Air Force. Okay, there was no German Air Force at this point of the war in Italy. There were mainly uh, German planes, ME-109s, which were built uh, in Germany, but which were flown by the part of the Italian Air Force, which remained loyal to uh, Mussolini after 1943. Um, and you can see here that the total number that they could muster was roughly around 60. Um, now, the other point is that they were operating uh, from uh, three distinct uh, airfields, main airfields, which you can see here highlighted in red. And you can see that none of them is really that close to the Brenner line. And in fact, um, even though there were a couple of attempts of making mass concentrating against the bombs, first of all, the bomber never the Oh, we, we, we lost your audio for a few seconds there, Nicola. Can you repeat that last bit? Oh, oh it was going so well. Uh, are you there, Most Nicola? Most of the Italian Air Force could only upper... Oh, sorry about that. Is it better now? It's better now, yeah. Can you can you just go? We got as far as the airfields me? not being very close. Um, I am. And then I think can we you just, hear me? Yeah, yeah. We hear you now. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Nicola. It's that cloud cover. It's got us. Okay, so yeah, they are not very close. So you can see that they were not close to the. They were not close to the Brenner line. Is it bit Hello? 
Yeah, I think we're better. I think it's better again now. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Is it better now? Yeah, we're better now. We're good. We're good now. Yeah, Whew. sorted again. Oh no, hang on. I spoke too soon. I don't know what the issue is today, folks. It doesn't appear to be my end. All right, hello again. Uh, okay, is it better? Any better? Um, I can hear you now. Yep, just waiting for the PowerPoint hello? to come back. Hello. There we okay, are. Okay, try to reconnect. Yeah, so sorry about that, good. guys. Yeah, really no worries. We apologize. Um, nevertheless, uh, so only three main airfields that they were operating from. About 60 fighters uh, was the main force. Um, and they only attempted uh, twice uh, or three times, actually, mass attacks on the bomber formation. But you have to take into account that the bomber formation itself was uh, protected by a fighter escort. Uh, and the Allies pretty much enjoyed the air supremacy at this point of the war uh, over Italy. Um, and only in one occasion, one of the B-25s was downed by one ME-109. So uh, in this particular instance, uh, the Air Force was not very effective at uh, countering uh, the... Sorry, the Italian Air Force was not very effective at countering uh, uh, the German... Uh, uh, sorry, the Allied effort. Now... A little bit about the repairs, okay? This was uh, really an important uh, part of the battle. It was, as I said, a struggle between the repair, the German repair effort, and the Allies attacking over and over the same target. You can see an example here of um, an actual German drawing uh, detailing how to repair a stretch of a generic stretch of a railway. Um, and in particular, you have to consider that uh, for what concern uh, the repair effort, uh, this was a very capillary organization, meaning uh, it was spread all over the line. We are talking about uh, roughly 20,000 people working uh, at the peak of the effort uh, in repairing uh, this line. Uh, the headquarters was in Verona, but uh, there were uh, basically several companies headed by a captain that were responsible for a certain stretch of the railway. And so they were basically assigned a stretch. And if damage occurred in that stretch, the headquarters would call that section, would describe the type of damage, and they will dispatch a crew, which was already pre-organized to take care of the repairs. They also had, the Germans also had the deployed um repair trains on the line meaning uh, a train which was built from the ground up to carry out uh, repair work these were generally made of an administration car which were, was where all the files were kept on how to do the repairs and so on and uh, how they were organized there were between two to four workshop uh, cars uh, where you could have uh, uh, the beams cut uh, to length uh, and uh, and whatnot. Uh, there were between one to two uh, accommodation cars, so basically uh, a field kitchen and uh, some some field uh, some small uh, field hospital. Uh, and then you would have uh, between one to two flat cars, where they would have already put all the spare rails, uh, the cross sections, uh, uh, and everything they would need to use to repair uh, a railway. And typically, uh, what happened was that these cars would approach from two sides of the area to be repaired, and crews would start working from each side, and they will meet at the middle. So as you can see, it was a very efficient organization. It was very, um, also very, very uh, fast in deploying uh, to the necessary uh, damaged uh, sections. Um, to give you an idea, it took uh, between, as, as it is written here, between four to seven days maximum to repair, to fully repair a bridge. And uh, uh, in the case of fields, 
um, which had been cratered by the bombs, sometimes it would take uh, 12 hours, but no more than 24 hours. So in 24 hours, they would just have the, the, the field completely repaired. Now, to give you an idea of the repair effort, you start by rebuilding uh, what is called the piers. So the, the pillars that sustain uh, the, the railway. You do this uh, by either using uh, pre-built uh, uh, sections, as you can see here on the left-hand side picture, or by combining these uh, with uh, uh, things which are put in place uh, uh, ad hoc at the moment, um, which you can see uh, represented on the right-hand side. Sometimes, uh, we will see an example in, in one minute, sometimes uh, you will see um, that instead of using a pier, they will just fill in whatever there was uh, below the pier. Um, and then lay, the next step is to lay an I-beam or a girder all the way across. Preferably one single girder that will go from one end to the other. Okay? And what they were using were these, what they were called nose cranes. So you can see that it's a railway track with a very long boom with a crane at the very end. So they will, they will build the piers and they, they will progressively start laying out the, the, the girders until they go all the way to the other end. And then on top of that, now you can see here very, very well the, the girders. And then you can see that they are laying the, the cross sections and then they are laying the railway tracks actually. And in this case, as you can see, they are actually repairing a double track at the same time. Another example, which I was just mentioning before, is here. The, they are not rebuilding the piers. They are just using material, OK? And then they are putting everything on top of it. You can see the nose crane here being used. And uh, um, in, in a, a, a big example is given by the Lavis Viaduct. You can see here the original bridge. Only two spans were left standing, and everything else has been repaired. You can see the nose crane over here. You can see the replacement spans. So they built the piers, and they put the spans on top. And then here, for example, what they did is they repaired the field. So they filled in the earth, and then they put the, the, the railway tracks back on top. OK? So this was. Um, as I said, a very well organized effort on part of the Germans. And it was very, very successful for at least uh, the first uh, three to four months of the battle. So November, December, January, and almost February. Then the tide um, of the Allies bombing was just so huge that for the Germans, it was really, really difficult to keep up uh, with, with the bombing effort. And mainly, you have to take into account that these repairs were occurring uh, during uh, the days when the weather was bad enough for the bombers not to be uh, flying. So they enjoyed uh, this uh, particular advantage, uh, as you can easily imagine, in the months I just uh, I just mentioned. But the Germans did not, did not stop here. They started using uh, diversions and deception. So first of all, diversions. This is a great example here. You can see the original bridge is on the uh, top left corner. Then they started building a diversion here, but they did not complete it. And then there is a, a second diversion all the way over here. And then, as you can see, all these tracks, uh, they kind of all join back together. So this means that uh, when they could build diversions, uh, the Allies, all of a sudden, instead of having one single target, uh, had one more target to bomb or even two more targets to bomb in the same area okay on the right hand side you can see what they also started to do they started to fool the allies into thinking that they were not using a certain bridge uh, bridges anymore by removing the bridge during the daytime and then putting it back at night and then removing it again in the day as you can see, these are three pictures taken on the same day, the 26th of February. One is a day picture, and they mark that this span has been removed. During the night, they put it back. And then during the day, they removed it again. And the Allies, once they found out this, 
they started to harass the lines during the night, mainly with A20s. But also the Allies didn't stop uh, in developing offensive tactics. They, they were just not uh, uh, sitting idle and uh, having the Germans uh, developing their defensive tactics. So one of the main tactics that they started using was the use of white phosphorus bombs over the uh, flak positions. You can see an example here. If you drop the white phosphorus from a uh, high enough altitude, basically what it does, it creates a, a cloud of smoke that progressively falls down on the position. Um, now, this has uh, basically two main effects. The first one is, of course, it hinders uh, line of sight. Um, but most notably, white phosphorus is an agent which burns the skin on contact. So when the um, flat crews would find uh, would see this being dropped, they would have to seek shelter. Um, and this means that they were not able to man the guns, okay? In fact, this uh, tactic was so effective that the flak crews started to target the bombers that were tasked with bombing them instead of the bombers that were tasking with bombing the target. Okay. So um, this was one of uh, one of the tactics that was put in place by the Allies. The second one I have seen it mentioned way before in the chat was SHORAN. SHORAN is an acronym which stands which stands for short range navigation. And it's basically an evolution. You may have heard of uh, Oboe or uh, Weigerat from the Germans. And uh, in this case, uh, the evolution is that uh, the post-processing of the information is done on board of the aircraft, not on ground. So you are not transferring to the aircraft the position, but the, the, the aircraft is figuring out its position from um, these two radio beacons, which is receiving uh, from two different stations. You can see a diagram here of how it works. This is from a 1945 paper. So uh, this is uh, the computer. This is the receiver. And then you can see that uh, what actually happens is that uh, the bomber transmits over two different frequencies uh, to two different uh, receiving stations of the beacons. And then the beacons uh, retransmit the signal back on two different frequencies to the, oh, sorry, on the same frequency to the receiver. This allows the bomber to calculate uh, the shift between the two in time and uh, knowing uh, with, with uh, good uh, uh, knowledge, having good knowledge of um, the, the relative positions of the two beacons, uh, they could figure out uh, their position with very, very high precision, okay? And uh, uh, in fact, it was so effective that uh, uh, at one point, uh, the Allied, Allied bombers became immune to the weather. They could bomb through a complete overcast um, with a precision which was less than 20 feet. Okay? So this was a major breakthrough for the Allies. Now, this system was pioneered by the 57th Bomb Wing in World War II, and it was... Um, extensively used by uh, the United States Air Force in Korea. So in Korea, Korea is where it is most famous for, but its first use was actually with the 57th bomb wing in World War II. Right. The final tactic they adopted, I just mentioned it briefly before, um, was night interdiction. So they were using A-20s and A-26 in pairs or four, loose, four planes of loose formation, and they would harass um, over the night uh, the same railway lines, picking out targets, and they were also on the lookout for motor transport uh, on the nearby roads, okay? Um, so they would also, in case, uh, uh, attack the motor transports, which were used uh, to complement uh, or replace uh, the interdicted lines on the railway. And finally, we cannot discount the huge contribution made uh, by the P-47s, uh, uh, which had been turned into fighter bombers. Um, they were also responsible for many of the attacks on the single small bridges. Uh, but another very important task that they had just by flying over the targets uh, was to harass the repair teams. So they were really hindering the repair 
the repair effort. This is the overall timeline of the Battle of the Brenner, after all we discussed. And you can see the drop, the significant drop of uh, trains circulating uh, over uh, the line as the battle progressed. Now, one thing that should be said is that the Allies, in the end, uh, managed to get to the famous 6,000 tons at the very end of the battle. But uh, in reality, this figure is an aggregated average of what was circulating over the overall line. But if you look at the data for the line, only the last part of the line between basically Trento and Verona, the number of trains that were circulating in April of 1945 was basically zero. And uh, this had a major impact, not only because uh, also according to the Germans uh, that were interrogated at the end of, uh, uh, of the battle uh, for Italy, so from Wittinghoff and his subordinates, they admitted that uh, this line, the severing of this line was one of the major factors for them of not being able to uh, put up a defense after the Gothic line was pierced. Uh, but mainly it was because um, their, the use of this line was, was interdicted, for, especially for the troops. So they could not move troops around, not only on the Brenner, but they could not move troops around all over Italy. They were static, basically. Um, you can also see in this timeline that they attempted uh, twice, actually three times, um, to withdraw some of the forces uh, from Italy um, to actually um, move them to other fronts. And in the first case, the accounts uh, uh, given are that uh, the, 30, the 356th uh, uh, Infantry Division was not able to move with its material. They were only able to move um, the soldiers. And it took them three weeks uh, to go over the Brenner line. So from one end to the other, it took them three weeks uh, with a combination of um, riding uh, uh, trains, walking, and using motor transport. Um, the same can be said for the 16th uh, SS, the infamous uh, 16th of SS, if I can add. Uh, they were responsible for a lot of uh, war crimes uh, in Italy. Um, and then finally, they also attempted to withdraw the 750 uh, if I remember correctly, uh, infantry division. And again, in all these instances, it took them over three weeks uh, to just move the people. They could not move, um, they could not move the, the, the equipment with them. Um, another important thing that should be mentioned is that under pressure by the Allies, by beginning of March of 1945, Switzerland eventually uh, ceded uh, um, and uh, stopped allowing German trains of any kind to go through um, through Switzerland. And this was another major blow to the use of coal, because Italy does not have any coal and cannot uh, actually produce any. Uh, so they were all using coal that was coming from Germany. And with the combination of having uh, killed the electrical power on over the line and uh, having to use coal, which was not coming through Switzerland anymore, uh, but had to come from, from the Brenner as well, you can imagine that this had a major, major impact. So much so that basically by the time that the Allies offensive uh, uh, resumed on the 9th of April, it took them less than a month uh, to have uh, uh, the full surrender of all Italian forces, uh, German forces, I'm sorry, in Italy. Um, so in less than a month, they broke through the Gothic line. The, they flooded literally the Po uh, River Valley, and then they moved all the way up to the Alps. Right. Um, so now, uh, just some curiosities. Um, well, most of you have, uh, already something in mind. I have seen also from the chat, uh, but before we talk about somebody else, let me talk about, uh, an important person that was part of the 57th bomb wing as well. So Donald Dick Slayton, to some of you may not say much, but, uh, to somebody like me, who is also a big uh, space buff, a space uh, uh, exploration buff, uh, Dick Slayton was in charge of the astronaut team during all of the major uh, NASA programs, Mercury, yep. Gemini, and uh, finally the Apollo program. 
Um, it was one of the original Mercury 7, then eventually was medically grounded. You can see it's, uh, he's uh, the one with the red shirt in this picture of the Mercury 7. Uh, he's again with the red shirt here, uh, discussing with the Buzz Aldrin, uh, Michael Collins, uh, just before the momentous uh, Apollo 11 uh, mission. And uh, finally, he got his stint, he got back his stint to fly on uh, the Apollo Soyuz uh, test program in 1975. So, um, of course, he was not uh, involved in the Battle of the Brenner because by the middle of 1944, he was actually assigned as an instructor instructor back into in the US. So he did not participate in the battle, but he was part of the 340th uh, bomb group of the 57th bomb wing. Finally, of course, there is uh, Mr. Joseph Heller. Um, you have mentioned Catch-22. He was indeed a bombardier in the 340th um, bomb group. Um, he, he arrived as a replacement crew in May 1944, and he left in January 1945. Now, uh, one fun bit, we discussed this with the, um, Paul before the show started, is actually that if you take, uh, there is one um, uh, little book which is called New World Writing, and it's like an anthology of uh, some emerging authors and this is a book which was published in 1955, there is a, a first chapter of a novel which is actually called Catch-18. So indeed, the, for some reason, the initial uh, draft of the novel was called Catch-18. And the funny thing is that if you read this first chapter in this anthology, um, it actually talks about the fact that uh, the bombers were based in Corsica. Whereas if you now read Catch-22, the bombers are based in Pantelleria, which is a completely different island in a completely different place in Italy. It's way south, southern yeah. than Sicily. Um, so it's interesting to have, uh, to have this connection. But not only that, but there is another book which is in the references I gave uh, to Paul, which is called The Bridge Busters. Um, and there is also a very interesting website by the same author. Uh, which is also in the links I provided to Paul, uh, which discussed the fact that uh, uh, Joseph Heller seems to have had a, a sort of a privileged treatment out of his role. In fact, he stopped completely um, flying actual bombardment uh, teams from September 1944. He was deeply shaken by a mission in August uh, 1944, uh, where they were called to bomb a target which um, to many of the people flying that mission looked like a civilian target. They were supposed to bomb this village because there was a crossroad they were told was going to be used by a Panzer Division. And in the end, they did not drop. Um, they got reprimanded. And uh, it seems like uh, this was probably the um, the experience that uh, shook him so much that uh, he was, despite what is written in Catch-22, he was actually taken out of the flying missions, of the actual bombing missions, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And he was, the, the, the picture you see at the bottom right is him in a B-25. But the funny thing is that this picture comes from an actual reel, so an actual film, that was made by the 57th bomb wing um, as a training video. And um, the, the, the website I gave uh, Paul talks extensively about this. And um, basically he was involved in this filming and this filming kept him from flying actual missions. The other strange thing is that he was sent home in January, 1945, but he had only flown 60 missions and by then the number necessary to to go back home to have a ticket back home was 75 so sorry 70 so he was 10 missions short and uh, short and despite that he was sent home so there is a big uh question mark of uh whether or not the moral qualms that somehow he addresses in 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 a very um uh, not only ironic, but uh, sometimes a uh, uh, very, very uh, razor sharp uh, way in Catch-22 may have really been part of his life. Um, so this is uh, 
another important person that was part of uh, of uh, the 57th bomb wing and of course that as many of you in the chat already uh, already already mentioned uh, is the biggest connection with this uh, battle of the brenner mm. but there are also a couple of more curiosities uh, you know there is um, actually a bomber that was downed near Rovereto in February of 1945 and there is one piece of it which is actually surviving to this day it's used as a window in one of the houses in this village so this is an actual um, uh, cockpit uh, uh, glass of the that bib 25 you can see the handle here to open it um, which is today just a recycle um, as a window in in a house i pretty sure that the U U.S. Air Force doesn't know about this. Um, and finally, um, if you want to, uh, you can still see some of the flat positions around Bolzano to this very day. Um, actually, this picture here is taken from these positions. You can see how high they were. Yeah. Okay? So this is Bolzano all the way down in the valley. Um, and you can see that they were very well built, um, like uh, concrete uh, masonry structures. And here, for example, you can see that these are the actual bolts which were used uh, for the base of the 88. So um, all of this is um, part of a park now uh, near Bolzano. You can go and trek uh, or mount, ride your mountain bike uh, there. So with that, I, we have finally come to an end. Um, sorry, that was probably a little long. Um, I tend to get excited when I talk about things I like. <laughs> but. Uh, um, here are the sources I've used uh, for this presentation. All of these are uh, in the link uh, that uh, Paul uh, posted. And um, uh, one, of them, one of them is in Italian, which is right here at the bottom, but everything else is in English. Uh, these are two books you can easily get uh, from anywhere. Uh, these are actually PDFs, and uh, all of these are very, very interesting because they have been written by the 57th Bomb Wing themselves. In this case, in this case, by the uh, math of uh, historians, uh, right at the very end of World War II, so 1945. And you can browse them, and there is plenty of information. Most of the pictures I've used for this presentation are coming from these two books over here. This is a small pamphlet on the other end for just uh, the Operation Bingo. If you want to know more how they destroyed the, the four uh, power stations, the four transformer stations along the line in the early days of the Battle of the Brenner. Then here are two papers. One is about Shoran, and the other one is in Italian about uh, one particular day of the Battle of the Brenner, seen from the perspective of the Italians. And it is where I got to the picture of the window made by the B-57 uh, uh, windscreen um, from. And then invaluable, uh, if you want, uh, if you just want to go down this rabbit hole, which I did, uh, is this website, the 57th Bomb Wing Association. If you browse it, you find plenty of great stuff. Um, so, uh, for example, you have day-to-day -day mission reports. You can just read them as they were written the day that they flew the mission. You have plenty of pictures of what life was like in, on, in Corsica, uh, what was a lot of uh, pictures taken in flight. Uh, and you have one great section, which I love, about all the nose arts on the B-25s. You can actually see actual nose arts on the B-25, <clears throat> on the B-25s. So um, it's it's really it's really fantastic, but it, it, it can simply um, devour all your time. So use with caution, <laughs> but uh, it's really well made, really, really well made. Well, brilliant so, stuff. Um, let's try and bring your camera back on uh, if we can for the, for the questions at the end. We've got a few. Um, okay. It's been brilliant, sure. absolutely fantastic, Nicola. I mean, loads of people were saying you you may not have counted yourself as a historian, but you you absolutely definitely are. I mean, the level of detail is incredible. But um, let's do a couple of questions first. So Thank going you. back to the repairs of the railway line, Andreas is asking, did they use Italian POWs for the repairs? Uh, mostly, as I said, were Bavarian and Moldavian uh, crews brought in. Um, and German railway pioneers, they supplemented them with uh, Todd organization members, which were drafted from the Italian population, but they were technically speaking, uh, not POWs. 
They okay. were almost forced the labor, uh, but technically they were paid uh, by for this work. Okay. Um, Thank you for that. And a couple of people asked about partisan activity. Was that ever a problem, an issue? No, it was not an issue on the Brenner line. It was mainly on the Northeastern line, uh, the ones, the other ones I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. On the Brenner line, it was not because what the partisans did in the winter of 1944 and 1945, they received from the high commands of the partisans uh, a suggestion to basically um get a low profile because the germans and with the help of the italians were really into partisan hunting activities right. so they said just for now disappear because the height because they have you have also to take to take into account that the brenner line for a good part is running through trentino alto adige which used to be up until the end of world war one part of austria so there was there were there were a lot of German sympathies there. Um, this is going to cause some flack, I'm sure. But uh, okay, if you read some of the accounts, um, the Germans were not seen as in the rest of Italy uh, for a lot of the people were uh, living, especially in the northern part of the Brenner. So of course this would mean that any partisan activity would not enjoy the support of the population necessarily. Okay. So this was also too dangerous, was deemed too dangerous. In fact, the funny thing is that if you read some of the accounts, the uh, partisans' uh, commanders uh, suggested that for the partisan to enroll in the Operation Todd organization so that they would just be paid and they could look at what the Germans were doing so that when the spring offensive of the Allies kicked in, they could use this information to the best uh, 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 to, to, to the most to, to, to be the, uh, uh, as uh, as effective uh, uh, as possible in the partisan activities in the spring. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got a couple more. And Bruce Dane was asking about were there any follow up raids to target the repair crews when they knew the work was going on? Do they try and specifically? Kind they, of the they, as I said, they harassed them with the P forty sevens mainly because the problem was that uh, in order to harass the repair crews, you need to be uh, able to loiter over the area for quite some time. And the bombers with the range, so coming from Corsica, being there, they they could not coordinate that with precision with the repair crews' effort. So mainly harassing the repair the repair effort was a task for the fighter bombers. Okay, thank you. And uh, David Levine is saying, I hope that Nicola will write a book. I would buy it in a heartbeat. So that's someone well, just being you. very complimentary. Well, thank you very much. But actually, there are books already uh, like this yeah, one. Yeah, but for we, example. we want yours now. We want yours ah. now. We want yours to take them all together. So, a great Jamin is asking, not sure if this was covered earlier, but what was the standard bomb load used for the bridge busting? Yeah, mainly they were using uh, 500 uh, uh, pounds uh, um, general purpose bombs. Uh, sometimes they use 1,000, and uh, 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 a lot of times they had a mixed load, uh, some with the, um, um, how do they call them, uh, delay fuses up right. to six hours. So they would drop, some would explode uh, at the moment they were dropped, and uh, some, about uh, one-third, they would be left there with the six hours fuse. Uh, but mainly it's a general purpose, that what that's what they used, 500 and 1,000 uh, pounds. Okay, thank you. And the last one from Gary. Um, what's the main takeaway you have out of researching the battle? So, you know, you, you talked about all those various sources you used. So you're, you're com coming at it from the kind of the historiography point of view, looking at it 80 years on. Any major takeaways you took from all the research? Um, I would say this. Um, as always, when you look at battles which span some time, you tend to think that they are static affairs. You know, there is an attacker, there is a defender, they start attacking and defending, and that's it. Um, as in many other topics I have researched, um, there is an evolutionary um, character in this battle, which is very interesting. Um, it was a struggle. Um, the Allies were going to prevail in the end, but mm. this did not prevent uh, uh, the Germans from attempting to um, keep this line open as a testament of the fact that it was really vital to them. Um, it, were the Allies successful in the end? I would say 
almost. Um, at least uh, if you read about the accounts that the Germans themselves uh, gave. Um, but if, for sure, they were able to develop a lot of tactics, uh, even if it was at the very end of World War II, which then in the end uh, proved uh, very important also in the following conflicts. So I would say that from this point of yeah, view... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a step along the way for that kind right. of improvement in precision bombing. And my, and my takeaway uh, from your presentation is that I think we tend to look at hits on railways as being one off. We think about maybe right. trying to achieve this knockout blow where you send in there, right. you hit out a yard. And what it is, it's, it's to use a boxing uh, uh, analogy, it's a, it's a long match and you're not going to exactly. get the knockout blow. What you do is you keep on doing body blows and exactly. left hooks and right hooks and you kind of win on points if you're going to win. You know, that, and that, that, that's kind of my takeaway is that. The movies haven't helped. The movies always have resistance Absolutely. people going out, you know, blowing up a bridge. And and we all we, we should know because it is well documented that in France and other places, the Germans are really good at fixing those things and getting those lines up and running in sometimes just hours later. So what you right. remind us, this this is a campaign. It, it has a beginning and it and it in, in the end, by the time you got to the end of it the need for the campaign has kind of moved away because the war has moved on elsewhere. So it it doesn't need to have a resolution as such because situations changed elsewhere. It's like planning for the invasion of Japan that was that was right. cut out because of the atomic bombs. This right. sort of thing, the, the, the you know the, the Russians, the Soviets are pushing the Germans out of out of East and Yugoslavia. The situation is changing there. Switzerland's changed their stance. So so the whole situation has changed. But this progressive campaign, I think, has been my takeaway. So yeah, well. We, we'll end it there, Nicola. We managed to persi persist through the glitches. We got there in the end. Sorry about that. Um, no, it's fine. It's one of those things. It's been fantastic stuff. And I can't wait to think for to wait uh, to invite you back for something else because uh, your oh, forensic you. level of detail is absolutely fantastic. So there we are. Um, folks, I'll see you again on Monday. Da uh, we have various shows next week. Damon Lewis is on next week. We've got shows about all sorts of things coming up. So, And then World War One TV has a show tomorrow night about uh, Africa, and there's one on Sunday with Robert Lyman. So don't forget to check Lucy's uh, uh, posts about that. So thank you, Nicola. Thank you, viewers. Thank I will you. see you all again. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.